Hey guys, I'm back with a new video, as I told you. Uh, many of you showed interest uh, last time uh, in seeing the, the process, the making process of uh, the, this diorama, this um, miniature display I showed you last time. First, this is not going to be a tutorial. It's more going to be a sort of showcase, an explanatory showcase with images uh, that I took during the process, uh, showing you, explaining you how I did. Of course, there are going to be a few techniques uh, I used and you you're going to get an explanation as to uh, why I use these or chose these. Of course, I did mistakes nonetheless. Uh, you know, the failures are at least as interesting as the, the successes in such endeavors. I hope you guys will like and I'll see you back at the end of the video. So as many of us players and DMs out there, early 2020 wasn't particularly the best moment to uh, play or run RPGs. On a personal level, it was also the birth of my first child. And then there was, of course, the COVID outbreak that came afterwards. So it became increasingly difficult to prep or even host any home game for me. So I pretty much haven't been hosting any uh, home games uh, since then. Now, I am fortunate enough to have another group with which I'm playing every other week. But it's mostly theater of the mind kind of things. We don't use any terrain playing with them. So my need for scat terrain pretty much stopped during 2020 and I had limited free time. But I did feel the itch for crafting though. Now like many of us crafters and players out there, I've got quite the extensive miniature collection. Many of them aren't painted, but some of them are actually painted and uh, sitting in drawers. So. I figured if I wanted to craft something, if it wasn't scattered terrain meant for games, I could actually work on a beautiful display for miniatures. I had bought this IKEA display case a little while ago and used it to store some miniatures, but the display really wasn't very convincing. So I thought, hey, might as well try something like a diorama that will also used, uh, be used as miniature display. So I had this idea of this towering display, a turnable display, cylindrical, that would fit inside the glass display case, that would turn, you know, on a sort of electric lazy suit, and that would be made out of five different stages that could be removed, LED lights also, and wires uh, running uh, inside the main shaft at the center, a sort of backbone of the whole structure. And, you know, displaying different universes, different spaces for miniatures. So I figured the first stage I would do would be a Viking stage, uh, constituted of a fjord, uh, the entrance to some kind of courtyard with a gate, uh, and a longhouse. So one of the main elements of the display was going to be the longhouse. These uh, characteristic housing uh, the Vikings had, the Norse had. Most of them have this very uh, a round shape. I went for something way more straight for the roof because I wanted. I could have gone with turfed walls, which were very popular uh, in Scandinavia, but instead I decided to go for the more uh, fully wooden uh, paneled longhouse. Keep in mind, like most of my crafts, I like to root it in historical references, but it's more meant for fantasy diorama, so it's Norse inspired but it's not supposed to be historically accurate. So I mainly use some wood glue and I built a frame out of coffee sears, um, out of kebab skewers and chopsticks, mainly. Now I didn't want the interior of the house to appear completely bland, nor did I want it to be too complex. So I chose to paint the base of the wooden posts, but with a very simple color scheme, uh, red, yellow and blue colors that were really favored by, by the Vikings, but with a very simple uh, design. So the long house wasn't high enough to cover up uh, the whole height of this stage. So I chose to put it on a hill to give it some kind of importance. So I chose to actually use the space underneath to create some sort of cave that could also be used as a sort of treasure room, something like that. And I wanted something that could connect with the fjord. So I thought about an a cave that was partially submerged uh, with uh, the water of the fjord. So I actually used some chest and bark to do the rock formations. This material is really great, I've already used it before. 
This bark actually really helps recreate the feeling of uh, rock formations. Now, it will never be as light as foam, but it will definitely be lighter than if you use, a, let's say, plasterer. As you can see, I've built it on a very thin and sturdy cardstock, just to make sure I was able to build it before and then set it afterwards inside uh, the space for the darum. Now, all the little pebbles were sculpted by hand uh, using air drying FIMO, but it took some time. Best option would be to use actual pebbles, but I didn't have micro pebbles back then. So here you can see the results with the longhouse uh, installed on top of the cave. I think the junction isn't perfect. I find it a little weird, the rocks like sitting in front of the house. Then again, you got sort of a, a cut view of the house. So, you know, why not? Uh, ain't perfect, but for the space I had, I think it looks actually pretty good. Now I divided the space of the diorama in three. There was going to be the longhouse and the cave, the fjord, and then the courtyard. I made some dockings with coffee sears. Uh, I used foam and also toilet paper and water down PVA glue to create a slope. Then I used chopsticks and barbecue skewers to actually build up the palisade. But I tried to replicate the depth by using toothpicks at the back. So you can see in the center tubing there that I've drilled a hole. And that's where all the wiring for the LEDs are going to pass afterwards. Now for the roof of the longhouse, I use a technique I've already developed before. So you can see uh, two tutorials on the channel explaining how to do it. So you've got the link in the description. It's basically using some twine, some sizzle to replicate the thatch effect. Now for the lights, I had bought this very nice 12 volt LED. Uh, so at first I thought about sticking it that way on top of the ceiling of this, uh, this stage with some reflective aluminum foil. But I was afraid of two things, that it would be way too bright on the miniatures below, you know, very harsh and crude lights coming from above. And also you see that later on, I decided to do a tree in this uh, centerpiece to hide this centerpiece. And so it was gonna be very difficult to build that amongst the lights. Also, if I had any issue with the wiring, with the, you know, the electronics, it was going to be a real nightmare to try to do some repairs or solder. So what I decided to do is actually to glue the strip all around the disc with uh, the LED, you know, hidden be behind a strip of uh, thin cardstock. I also made sure to isolate two or three LEDs uh, just to be sure they would be able to glow uh, just above the hole in the roof. I think it looks pretty neat. Also, what was interesting was that this 12 volt LED came with a switch that enabled to vary the intensity of the light. That's pretty cool. So I've put on the links of what I bought uh, in the description. When I buy something that isn't locally purchased, I remember to you guys, I live in Europe, in France. I, if I purchase via Amazon, I usually use Amazon FR, you know, for, for France can probably check the same uh, brands, just maybe you won't have the same sellers. So as you've seen in this last footage, I started doing a tree at the center of the display. So my first idea was actually to use uh, some sort of image of a beautiful fjord, giving the impression that the space was actually deeper, but it didn't really work because it was way too obvious that it was just an image, like a cheap, theater uh, background. It actually cuts the house in two. It didn't fit with the palisade, just didn't pan out, didn't work. So instead, <laughs> I chose to do something that turned out way cooler. It was actually to do Yggdrasil, the world tree that connects all nine realms uh, of men, of gods and giants, Jotuns and everything. So quite literally the spine of Norse cosmology. So, as you can see, I built it using aluminum foil to make the bulk of the shape of the tree. Aluminum is really light, pretty cheap. And you can actually sculpt it to some extent to give some rough shapes. You can actually twist the coils of aluminum when you sculpt them to give the impression it's gnarled wood. So what I've been doing lately is actually use some, uh, some medium for painting or spackle if you want. Uh, but back then what I used was actually some toilet paper with watered down PVA. 
and the good old papier mache technique. It actually works pretty well. You can even use a brush, the texture given underneath by the aluminum foil while smoothing it and making it look way more organic. It isn't perfect, but actually it looks pretty well. Afterwards, I painted it and did some washes just in the big recesses to create a sense of depth. I also used some thin twine and string to applicate some ivy stamps. And I used some very thin grout. I think it was made from very thin sawdust that I glued and painted green to replicate some moss growing on the tree. Now, probably one of the best features of uh, this center tree is the ivy leaves. So here's a short tip. You can find uh, ivy leaves in, you know, in, in batches, in boxes that you can buy from sellers online. Don't do that. Provided you've got some birch trees around. So basically these are made with scales coming from birch catkins. In the catkin that you can actually crumble very easily, you'll get the seeds that look like other types of leaves but not the ivy leaves and the scales and the scales do look a lot like ivy so it's going to be very fiddly it'll take some time but it'll look pretty much amazing so in another older vid i used some parsley to replicate the ivy on another project it worked well enough but now that i know you can use some birch uh, catkin i'm definitely going to use that so now i was going to work on the foliage of yggdrasil so I used some cotton balls and glued them on top of the ceiling. Then I pretty much covered them with parsley and glued them on with PVA. I also painted the white paper that was behind just to give the impression that the foliage was a bit denser and give the impression that light was actually filtering from above. It ain't perfect, but it looks pretty good. I kind of regret not putting some finer and better looking leaves on top. The parsley mix ended up pretty rough on the edges, not really great on details, but in any case, you don't really see a lot of the ceiling on the display. You can see it if you intend to watch, but it's not the main center of attention in the display, so it's not a biggie, but it's definitely not perfect though. At the same time, I was working on furnitures for the longhouse. Now, I took inspirations on actual SCA reenactment uh, furnitures based on historical finds. Of course, I simplified them uh, for the diorama. And I used some fake fur that I scavenged from a damaged plush I had. Also did two doors with some hinges. One door for the longhouse that I could actually open and close and actually latch. And the other one for the entrance of the courtyard, closing the, the enclosure around the estate. Now I did that to be able to vary the scenes that I'm going to be able to move uh, the miniatures and actually make stories. I still haven't had time to do this, but ideally I can, you know, move miniatures and create small stories and take pictures. And I think I'll try to do that because it shouldn't be too hard and it could be cool, you know, taking pictures from right angles and create stories with the miniatures I have. Of course, I need to paint more of them. I did other details too. So I wanted to do some glowing bioluminescent mushrooms inside the cave. So I actually crafted these entirely out of hot glue. So with a small glue gun, I actually uh, poured some drops of hot glue on top of a baking parchment paper just to obtain the, the hats of the mushrooms. And for the stems, I actually shoot directly the hot glue inside a cold water glass. So it makes a very thin uh, stem of hot glue that pours inside the glass and the cold water actually directly settles, uh, hardens the stems and you only have to cut them with a pair of scissors. I actually super glued the hats and the stem together if I remember correctly. I painted them white and then for the bioluminescent effects I actually used some glow-in-the-dark pigments coming from Green Stuff World mixed with some varnish and I just applied a thick coat on it. It works pretty well. It charges up with UV so actual sunlight works if the diorama uh, gets enough sunshine during a good period of time. You can make it work faster and harder using directly some a UV lamp. 
Then again, the effect is very strong for a few seconds, then fades slowly, but it actually lasts quite some time, but it won't be as strong as when you hit it with UV light at first. Still, I find it's a nice touch. As you can see, I also uh, tapped and spattered on the walls of the cave a little bit of this mix of glow-in-the-dark pigment, just to give the impression that other types of bioluminescence uh, mushrooms or lichens or, or spores actually spread on the rock formations all around the mushrooms. So after giving it some thoughts, I decided to add a small waterfall that was pouring from the side of Yggdrasil. I thought it would enhance the idea of scale if a waterfall was pouring down this tree. It would look cool since there's a fjord just underneath, so it would be logical and look nice. Also, it's deeply rooted in uh, Norse mythology. Since amongst the branches of Yggdrasil are living some magical stags, now from these antlers is pouring some rain and some streams that eventually form all the rivers of the Nine Realms. So it does make sense to make a waterfall falling down from Yggdrasil. So at first I thought I was going to use some holographic paper with some silicone on top and some glitter, but it didn't pan out, it didn't look good. So I ended up using some UV resin and it gave a very clear effect. I'm sure you can do it better, but it looks pretty convincing to me. So I decided to add some interesting shapes and a touch of color on Yggdrasil and went for those mushrooms growing on top of the world tree. So that would add some colors and give some different shapes. But also give the impression that life was you know, thriving and growing on Yggdrasil. So I didn't forget from time to time to actually set the diorama inside the display case. So I would make sure that it actually turns without any hindrance with the glass display case. I had to do some adjustments, but it pretty much worked. Also crafted some smallish birch trees. And I actually used some simple uh, twigs to do this. I did some foliage, I painted these up. Now there are still some job to be done inside the longhouse. And one of the main interesting feature of the longhouse is actually the fire pit. So for this piece, I made an exception. I decided to do something that I could actually leave in the display when I wanted to, but that I could actually use for a home game. Now, one of the main features of this fire pit is this intricate sort of ironwork, you know, holding the cauldron on top of the embers. I simply used a wire cage that is holding uh, the cork of a bottle, it was a big bottle of beer, but you can find it on bottle of champagnes too. So it works wonders to create this uh, twisted ironwork effect. I think it works good. Now for the embers, there was an actual LED underneath. It's a small LED with a CR battery. So to make sure the light will be able to diffuse, I actually used some salt, coarse uh, salt crystals to make the embers at the center. And I only painted them uh, red and black on the edges of the fire and made sure to leave the center, uh, you know, translucent to make sure the light would shine through. A small feature that you can't really see on images but looks really great if you want to go the extra mileage to have amazing, you know, uh, lighting effects on your fire. You can see the logs that are all around the, the fire. Well, what I did was use some golden wrappings, you know, the type of wrappings you get around chocolates at Christmas, the really shiny golden wrappings. Now I used them and glued them on the tip or on the sides of the logs everywhere the fire might have, you know, eaten out and create some embers directly on the logs. What it does is that it actually reflects the lights coming from the LED in a way more convincing manner than it would have been with simple paint. I'm really happy of how it turned out. And the photos don't give it justice, trust me. It looks amazing. Now concerning the crockery that you can see around the fire pit, these are actually castings uh, from molds I made, but I actually purchased uh, all these items from Tiny Furniture. It's a Russian company that makes some amazing furniture and food and tavern items and market stuff. Now, their stuff is a bit pricey, but it's well worth it. So I actually did some castings, but yeah, their stuff is pretty cool. Now, what would be a Viking household without one of these beautiful warp weight looms? Of course, I used some references, image references, and I really went the extra mileage to make sure it would look good. So it was really fiddly, 
but I'm extremely happy with the results. I mean, it was really worth it. So the tapestry at the back of the longhouse is actually just, you know, plain paper. It's actually printed from a replica of a Nosberg, actual Viking Osberg tapestry. I'm sure you can find it online. So there you go, you've pretty much got the interior of the longhouse done. I'm extremely happy with the results. It looks cozy, it looks, you know, credible, it looks warm, it looks like wood, it looks like fur. It really looks like an interior you would find inside a longhouse. I also did a small longship docked uh, inside the fjord. Of course, I had to do a small longship, so this is more or less a car fee. So it's a very small longship. So essentially to build the Garfi, I use a technique I used in a previous tutorial. It's mainly made from cardstock, believe it or not. At first I thought about making it removable to be used in game, but with all the resin around it, the water effect, it seemed pretty obvious it was going to be set, definitely in the diorama. So if you're interested in building one of these uh, ships, I've got a full tutorial covering it up. So you can check this out if you want to build your own. Now I decided to cover up this unsightly uh, cardboard strap uh, hiding the LED. So I decided to hide it with a foam strap with actual runes and actual Norse inscriptions uh, engraved on top of it. And I took inspiration from actual memorial uh, Viking stones. Now most runic stones featuring inscriptions and texts are actually memorials to the dead. So I actually adapted one of the texts of one of the memorials. Um, so yeah, believe it or not, but you can actually find uh, an equivalent in Old Norse for tabletop games because uh, these guys were really onto uh, chess kind of games and they really relished tabletop games, but more in the sense of uh, board games, actually. So it's more, more board games they used. I'm not a linguist, so there's probably some issues with the text and this, uh, the syntax, but I tried to do my best. Of course, the inscription wasn't long enough for the whole strip, so I then just used some terms describing the whole diorama. So there's the name of a fjord, uh, there's the name Vigrid, which is the courtyard, the plain where, where battle surges and where the inheritors, the fallen warriors, fight trained there until uh, the confrontation with, during Ragnarok and also wrote a great longhouse or something like that, I don't remember. I found it was an elegant way of hiding uh, the unsightly strap of cardboard underneath. Now the last steps were only adding uh, the water effects and the static grass and the small turfs and the flowers. Now for the water effect, at first I consider using the cheap option and using some silicone because it will also be light. But I was afraid that the silicone would actually catch the dust. So I ended up using some resin. So I went first for thin coats because I didn't want it to be too heavy. And I used some UV resin because I thought it would be um, very thin coats. And what I did was blow on it with a uh, nail brush. And with UV resin, I was able to fix, you know, the ways in the making as I was actually vaporizing some air on them to give them dynamism. But there are two main issues. First, even if it was a thin coat, the surface on which there was resin was so important, it actually created a warp effect on the whole diorama. So I was able to compensate this with some milliput underneath, but it wasn't the greatest option. That's the reason you've got this kind of thick wave effects that I had to cover up with some paint and a little more uh, of this UV resin. And the second issue is actually that UV resin isn't cheap. So next time I have to do a plane of water with some water effects, I'll be sure to use some proper water effects. It would probably be a lot lighter by the end and also cheaper to use. And pretty much the only thing that was left to do was to add some static grass. So I did. Without an applicator, I don't really use an applicator. I use some PVA glue and then I just put the grass with some tweezers. Since I don't do some huge, uh, you know, wargaming terrain, it doesn't take a lot of time and actually works pretty well to get them straight up. And then just brush away or vacuum the excess of grass. 
I used some turfs I had remaining that I bought from Green Soft World. And actually, with old brushes and some pieces of old coconut mats, I did some small bushes here and there and some small plants and flowers. Now, since then, I've been on a total rampage buying pre-made vegetation. So I'm sure I'm going to be using that on one of the stages that is supposed to be featuring a forest. I'll definitely gain some time next time to do the vegetation and the small shrubs and flowers. I'm going to be using some pre-made stuff to do the meadows. But for this one, I actually did pretty much everything by hand. I think I've covered most of the diorama and how I did it. I uh, hope you guys liked it. So if you guys are interested in uh, seeing uh, this running project uh, of mine, uh, don't forget I'm building the lower stage as of now. So if you're interested in seeing the process, uh, you can head on to my Instagram account where I can post more regularly some pictures. And what I'm going to do if you guys are interested is um, I've already started doing it, but I'm just at the early stages is taking pictures of this second stage as well and more pictures and more uh, videos of the process hopefully in you know the purpose of editing another type of these uh, explanatory showcases showing how i built uh, the lower one as well there you go so i hope uh, this video was interesting to you guys um don't forget to you know share like subscribe hit the bell icon everything uh leave a comments in the um, in the comment section Give me feedback if you got some some things you liked or some alternative uh, for some stuff I did or some other types of techniques or, or materials uh, you can um, you can advise me to use. Uh, I'm yeah you'll be more than welcome. In any case, uh, you guys take care, uh, keep on crafting, uh, keep on staying awesome, and I'll see you around. Bye.